Welcome to Word Pictures, a program of discussion and discovery. We examine the stories, events, and persons as described in the Word Pictures, presented in the 66 books of Scripture we know as the Word of God. But what kind of God is pictured here? By reading these stories, some become fearful, others adore. Yet others are just confused. Come, let us see for ourselves in an unrehearsed, no question barred discussion with people just like you as we search for the God of these stories. What picture of God will emerge for you? Let's join the discussion right now. Welcome to our discussion. We're so glad that you have joined us. As those of you who have been with us know that we have been working in the book of, of the Revelation, the last book of the Bible. And we've seen some marvelous things said that very uh, striking instruction to the churches. We're going to work in the area starting with chapter 4 this time. But I want to read the last part of uh, chapter 3 because there were no chapters and verse marks when this was written. And I think this kind of sets us up for what comes in chapter 4. Starting with uh, chapter 3, verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and I will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, even as I also overcame and have sat down with my father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. And now the book kind of takes it a, from, from a focus down here. It begins to look up in heaven again. And we're going to look at a throne room. Mm -hmm. And just remember, the promise is that you can be there. Yeah. John is suddenly taken off by another vision. And... I suspect that after hearing the, the chapters 2 and 3 and that, those messages, he might have been a bit discouraged. It wasn't a super exciting thing to hear all those messages. And all of a sudden, now, instead of looking at the churches here on this earth, he's taken in vision to the throne room in heaven. And let me read a few of those verses. Chapter 4, I hope you've got your Bible handy. Revelation 4. At this point, I had another vision and saw an open door in heaven. And the voice that sounded like a trumpet, which I had heard speaking to me before, said, Come up here. I will show you what must happen after this. Now, does that imply that he's going to show us something in the future? Sounds like it, doesn't it? At once, the Spirit took control of me. There in heaven was a throne with someone sitting on it. His face gleamed like such precious stones as jasper and carnelian, and all around the throne there was a rainbow, the color of an emerald. Okay, if I st stop right there, do we have any clues about who that might have been? Sounds like God. God himself. Yeah, it That's sounds God. like it's God himself, surrounded by a rainbow and so yeah. forth. Yeah. Um, in, in a circle around the throne, there were 24 other thrones, on which were seated 24 elders dressed in white and wearing crowns of gold. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings, and peals of thunder. In front of the throne, seven lighted torches were burning, which are the seven spirits of God. Also in front of the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. So what are we seeing here? You know, this is, in John's day, this is sort of like a modern television broadcast. You know how we do in TV these days. You know, you're watching something in Washington, D.C., and all of a sudden they say there's breaking news in Beijing, and bang, you're there. I mean, on, on the television, you just that fast. You switch it, and bang, you're over there. So here's John looking at the earth, and all of a sudden, he's looking at heaven. And what's going on up there? Well, there was a lot of activity. If you read on, a lot of stuff going on. And it looks like God is working for the benefit of his people. Um, do we have any idea who those 24 elders are? It doesn't say who they are. No. So we get to guess. Yeah. Are they the only ones around? 
we're well, going to read where it looks like there's a lot more than that. yeah elsewhere we're going to read that there are four creatures of some kind are those human-like creatures we don't know around the throne and then in Daniel we go back to Daniel 7 and there's how many more watching hundreds of millions watching what's going on around God's throne and what are those what do all those angels do they don't just stand there and look dumb I'm sure of that I know about God the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit yeah what's the seven spirits the seven spirits it's hard to know for sure. Again, we're not told exactly. But remember that in John's thinking and in Judeo, early Judeo-Christian thinking, seven was a perfect number. Mm -hmm. That was the, 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 and we're going to see later in this book that six is in, an incomplete number, an imperfect number. Uh, and that describes Satan and his activities. But seven is a perfect number and it's suggesting that God is everywhere seeing everything uh, through an extension of His Holy Spirit being everywhere, or His spirits, if you will, everywhere. It's not talking about seven separate individuals. It's, it's a symbol of, of something. I think that's the best guess that I've ever heard. Um, so, lo look, for example, just real quickly at Daniel chapter, chapter 7, verses 9 and 10, to see who else is watching. While I was looking, thrones were put in place. One who had been living forever, that of course would be God again, sat down on one of the thrones. His clothes were white as snow and his hair was like pure wool. His throne mounted on fiery wheels was blazing with fire and a stream of fire was pouring out from it. There were many thousands of people there to serve him and millions of people stood before him. The court began its session and the books were opened. So this again sounds like a judgment scene, doesn't it? And lots of people standing around. So does God need all those people to be present when he judges? I mean, doesn't God already know everything? Why does he need all that help? Well, when he judges, does it that he is making a declaration and giving the evidence for that declaration? And these are the interested parties that he's uh, got to talk to. Do you think the angels might have some interest in who's coming up there to be their neighbor? Sure. Future neighbors? They might care about whether or not these people are safe? Yeah, Dennis. Well, I was going to ask, is, um, maybe this is the jury. Mm -hmm. not, not, not 12 or 13 members, but 10,000 times 10,000. I don't think God has just picked a jury. I think everybody out there says, hold on, we want to know. <laughs> what God's up to and what he's going to be doing and we want to be a part of it. So we, we talk about the court of public opinion. Yes. Which, which is open to anybody and, and probably is the, the jury of last resort. Uh, maybe, uh, may, maybe God is, is, is trying to demonstrate something to all of us. Yeah. There's one model of that we have then Ellen White gives us a little insight into it and that was when it came time to announce that Satan was no longer going to be left in heaven mm -hmm. he gathered everybody through and she says he declared that Satan was no longer uh, welcome there it wasn't even though they had a whole crowd this was not a, a, a jury duty in the sense that yeah. I vote for, I vote yes or no. God provided the evidence, they all looked at it, and they, he said the reality, and they agreed. And, and why, would that be, why would that be so? Because he's the only one who can look into the heart, who can actually know the motives of people and make a right decision. Everybody else has com incomplete information. Okay, but you think God just said, believe me because I say so? No, no, no. I said he provided evidence. Okay. He provided the, the record. And that's the important thing. But I think, he has to add more than yeah, just the record. I think he lays out the evidence that other people aren't, you know, all the evidence is necessary as far as he's concerned. Yeah. And we look at that and say, God, yeah, there's no question about the fact that, you exactly. know. Exactly. Yeah. You, you're right. Dennis. Well, in Patriarchs and Prophets, in similar chapter, I think it's 29 in Great Controversy, Ellen White is talking about why, why God preserved Satan. Mm -hmm. 
that uh, he needed to be given time to demonstrate his character. Mm -hmm. That the answer, that, that the, the issue wasn't settled in heaven. God declared that Satan was no longer going to be uh, allowed in heaven. He was he was cast down here. It was more to be uh, there. But um, she says that his influence would never go away mm -hmm. if he were to wipe him out back then. Yeah. So not only not only did we need to see Satan's character mm -hmm. revealed, um, I believe we also needed to, need to see God's character revealed mm -hmm. because we, we have now had the privilege of seeing a side of God which could not have been seen in any other way. Yeah. And if you think about it, you know, the Bible wasn't going to be written for, I mean, the first chapters. Thousand years. Moses wasn't going to be on the scene for, what, 3,000 years, 4,000 years? Quite a while. You know, uh, so, so God's side of this story needed to be told as well. And uh, it's taken him a long time to defend himself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And he doesn't, he doesn't do things. He doesn't expect us just to believe him because he says so. That's right. Otherwise, he could, the whole thing could have been over in a few minutes. He says, look at the evidence. Look at the evidence. And Jim. the ultimate demonstration of, about the character of God was re, uh, at the cross, Romans yeah. 3, 25 and 26. Jesus' death was to demonstrate that God is righteous. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but yet, having done that, now, looking back, we've got 2,000 years since that time, mm -hmm. and uh, now his, God reels out the rope to Satan to let Satan more and more demonstrate what, he, what the ultimate dem will happen if you follow his, um, Satan's his plan. plan. But uh, like uh, he quoted there from Ellen White, that if, he, if Satan had been wiped out, somebody or somebodies or groups would still continue to perpetuate uh, his teaching. Well, yeah. we've got that going on. We, we see that with, uh, yeah. with uh, like guys like Hitler. We still have people that follow that, that uh, philosophy uh, and from time to time popping up. Well, you got the Satanists and, yeah. and so on and yeah. so forth today. Yeah. Never died. Yes. Fine. Uh, we mentioned Satan was cast out. What was he doing when he was able to walk around and persecute Job? One, another question, do you imagine that he has that capability now that he can go and say, oh God, let me do this to this person? He has the, the Satan certainly has the capability. The question now is whether God will allow him to do so. And the, the way I understand scripture and of course some of the writings of Ellen White, it seems pretty clear that as we approach the end of this world, it's, God is going to sort of step back a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more to allow Satan to have an opportunity to demonstrate what would happen if he were in charge. And we're going to see, and Satan, what will Satan want to do at, as the end approaches? What will be his goal? Destroy God's creation. Destroy God's people, especially the one people who are faithful to God. And is God going to allow that? No, he's not. So Satan is going to go mad and just crazy, and he's going to, in the seven last plagues, for example, he's going to almost destroy all of his own people in the process of trying to destroy God's people. Now, here in John, we've seen he's all of a sudden got a, a view of heaven. Is he the first person, first prophet to sort of have a vision of heaven? No. Can you name some others who had visions of heaven? Ezekiel, yeah, about Isaiah, that. and Daniel, and Ezekiel, and even Micaiah, who didn't write a book, we just read about him. Uh, uh, Stephen, Paul, in more modern times, and now John, uh, had visions like this. Heaven is a very busy place. And in front of that, that throne, it's, we're going to read later that there's a river flowing out from that throne, and in front of it, there's a sea of glass. What is a sea of glass? Any idea? Oh, no. It could be, it could be translated crystal, a sea of crystal. But they're walking on it. Yes, and but they're not the only ones. If you, if you look at Revelation 15, it'll be a while till we get there. But it says Revelation 15, starting with verse two. Then I saw what looked like a sea of glass mixed with fire. So this is a a sparkling sea of glass. 
I also saw those who had won the victory over the beast and its image and over the one whose name was represented by a number. They were standing by the sea of glass, holding harps that God had given them and singing the song of Moses, servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. So that's some place we would like to be in the future, right? Yes. Yeah, that's the place at, at the time when God receives his children back from this earth, back into heaven. Right. That's apparently one of the first places they'll go. Well, who are these four living creatures? Now, we talked a little bit about the 24 elders and all the other people who are, who are watching. What do we know about the four living creatures? Anything? You tell us. <laughs> full, of, full of eyes in front and behind. Strange yes. kind of creatures, aren't they? Yeah. Could, they um, be, could they be angels? Maybe. Maybe. Uh, Isaiah seems to see something similar, and he calls them seraphs. And Ezekiel sees something similar, and he calls them cherubs. What are seraphs and cherubs? Those are angels. They're types of angels, aren't they? Apparently, there are different types of angels. Now, we, we like to see our... I saw a cutest little baby today, about six months old, just round and chubby and so forth. We like to call them cherubs, but this is a different kind of cherub, right? <laughs> yeah. So, they apparently had six wings each, and are sometimes pictured as having the face of a man, an ox, and an eagle, and a lion. Uh, what would that imply? I mean, does this person got different faces on different sides? Is that the way that Speed, works? Speed, knowledge. <laughs> okay, eagle, speed. The man would be intelligence, wouldn't he? Mm -hmm. Lion would be what? Power. Power, strength, ox. More strength. <laughs> well, strength and maybe, you know, this is a, this is a useful animal. It's not just Right. It's scary, scary, scary powerful, but this is a, an animal you can use, a useful service animal. So um, what would that imply about these six-winged creatures that stand around God's throne? They have many capacities, and they're willing to use yeah. it for God. Yeah, and they're very important. They're, they're, they're willing to and are using them. Is it possible that Lucifer used to be one of those four creatures? Yeah, probable. Very likely. Now read Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14, and it talks about him walking among the stones of fire and so forth there, so it's very likely. Um, is there more than one person sitting on that throne, by the way? Well, did you notice I, In what I read in the end of chapter 3, mm -hmm. that we were invited to sit on his throne yeah. like he sat on his father's throne. Yeah. So apparently Jesus is sitting there, the father is sitting there, and some other people, apparently sometime in the future at least, are going to be invited to sit on that throne. So it's not just one chair here by, no. occupied by one person. It's probably a, a whole area where people can sit and, and talk together and do things together, right? It's a living room. A living room, okay. <laughs> well, now that we've had a look at the, the throne room in heaven, um, what are all these individuals doing? Do we have an idea? What do angels do in general? Do we know anything about that? They seem like they're messengers quite often. And when you yeah. realize how many worlds there are, we see from yeah. our puny perspective, it seems like a lot of messages might be needed. Yeah, exactly. Well, it says they were singing, holy, holy, holy. Yeah. yeah, we'll get to that in a moment. Back in Hebrews chapter 1, at the end of Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14, it says, what are the angels then? So we're going we're gonna to get a, an official reply. They are spirits who serve God and are sent by him to help those who are to receive salvation. So do each one of us have angels? Yes. What do we call them? We call them guardian angels, uh, and I suspect that every one of us could tell stories about times when it looked like we were saved from death because of accidents or whatever things that happened. Um, we'll, it'll be interesting to talk to our guardian angel in the future and see what, what all they protect us from or the way they tried to guide us this way or that way to try to, to help us. And of course, there's many verses in the Bible, places like Matthew 18.10 and Psalm 34, 7, that talk about the angels camping around us and, and protecting us. Well, what about the rainbow? Is that significant? 
Where else have we heard about a rainbow? Right here for, on the Earth. Right yeah, we see rainbows here, and the rainbow is a product of sunshine and rain. Okay. And was given. What? The promise after the flood. That yeah, the promise after the, the flood. Again with the, with the, with the water. Exactly. Very much Genesis 9, 8 to 17. So what are we seeing? I don't know how far you want to carry this, but the Holy Spirit is referred to sometimes as drops, as fluid being poured out. And God's described as a light, as a sun. Is this uh, God and the Holy Spirit reflecting in beautiful colors? Maybe so, huh? Could be. Jesus is also described here in Revelation 4 and 5 as a lion of the tribe of Judah, but also as a lamb. Could you be a lion and a lamb at the same time? You could have some characteristics of each. Yes, yeah. He's certainly powerful, but in his sacrificing himself at, on the throne, I mean, I'm sorry, not on the throne, but on the cross, that's more like the role of a lamb, isn't it? The king, you would think, of very egocentric. Mm -hmm. But when it acts like a lamb and gives yeah. total selflessness, it takes those two animals to kind of give a hint of how big God is. Yeah. There's a very interesting verse here um, that in Revelation 4 that we need to take a little bit of extra time to look at. Look at verse 8. Each one of the four living creatures had six wings, and they were covered with eyes inside and out. Day and night, they never stopped singing, Holy, Holy, Holy is the Lord Almighty who was, who is, and who is to come. What do you think that means? Yahweh. Yahweh. And, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to focus on the was, is, and is to come. Basically forever. Okay, that's the way we would read it normally in English. But that's not the way it reads in Greek. And it's not often presented this way. When it says, who is to come, it's not talking about the future. It says, he's coming. The Greek word is, he's coming. It's not talking about sometime long in the future. It's talking about someone who's literally coming. More active. Yeah, exactly. But doesn't it mean it's not yet, yeah. but coming? So who, that there is, who is to come. Yeah, who is to come. But it's not just, he's going to exist sometime in the future. We sometimes say, you know, someone is to come. It's that's a, that's a future event. He, but, but this is specifically talking about an arrival on, on planet Earth sometime in the future. Okay. Okay? So, and there's lots of places in the Bible, if you, if you want to compare, that support that idea that it's talking specifically about his, his coming. You're saying then, who is to come here? Yes. So it's the here that you'd it's, like to add to it. Yes, and, okay. and it's a specific coming. It's not just yeah. a future existence. We, we say, oh, it, it, that's something which is to come. If we're just talking yeah. about uh, the future is to come, we would say in English, meaning it's just something's going to happen out there, but not specifically. This, uh, this is in Greek. It says there's going to be a coming. Okay. The message says it simply. The was, the is, the coming. Okay, it was, is the coming. Yeah, that, that gives it a little closer yeah. meaning to that, doesn't it? Well, what we see here is that each time the camera focuses on heaven, what's going on? Things look pretty good. Yeah, and the father and son seem to be Rejoicing. ensconced, s sitting on their chairs in the heavenly sanctuary. Um, working together. Working together in perfect cooperation and everybody around them seems to be working in perfect cooperation. Why, why is it mentioning parts of the sanctuary? Remember, the, what parts were there in the ancient Hebrew sanctuary? The court, the holy place, and the most holy place. Okay, and what was in those places? In the courtyard, there was the altar of burnt offering. And the labor. There was the labor where the priests would mm -hmm. clean their hands and their feet before entering the, most, uh, the holy place. Mm -hmm. What was inside the holy place? Menorah, table of The showbread. menorah with the seven-branched uh, yeah. It really wasn't a candlestick, it was a lampstand. Okay. And what's on the other side? Table of showbread. Table of showbread, and at the back? Altar of incense. Altar of incense. And then in the most holy, there was what? The ark. The ark, Our okay. Presence. We're going to see that as we move along here through Revelation, we're going to see that there, the different parts of this sanctuary are mentioned. Why, why do you suppose that would be? 
Well, if we look at the Old Testament mm -hmm. and the, uh, the, the, the service that was given to the children of Israel, mm -hmm. uh, those, it, it seems to be a, a, a symbolic uh, representation of something to come. And here we have John looking at this something to come. I often get the feeling that, that uh, my colleagues want to reinvent what's to come in the form of what was in the desert. Yeah. I want to go the wrong way. Yeah. Well, it's interesting that this, and we've suggested this before, that the, if you want to really understand the book of Revelation, you need to understand a lot of symbols from the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. John is repeatedly, again and again and again, using ideas that were first uh, used in the Old Testament, or maybe repeatedly used in the Old Testament, and now they're brought into the book of Revelation. Now let's look at the sanctuary. The sanctuary is mentioned 14 times in the book of Revelation. That's a, that's a lot of, excuse me, it says a lot of times. God's throne is mentioned 40 times. Five of the major divisions of the book of Revelation are introduced with scenes that center on the sanctuary in heaven. The earlier scenes start in a holy place and the later scenes in the most holy place or in the temple as a whole. And that's another summary from our book, God Cares, Volume 2 from C. Mervyn Maxwell. Well, in the historical half of the book of Revelation, that would be Revelation 1 through 14, the section addressed to the seven churches, Revelation 1 to 3, began with Jesus standing amid the lampstands. The seven seals, which we will talk about later, begins with Jesus standing beside the table uh, throne or the throne of the bread of his presence. Revelation 5 to 7, the seven trumpets have him standing beside the golden altar of incense, Revelation 8 to, 12, 8 to 11, and the historical section of Revelation concludes with the great controversy focusing on the most holy place where we know there are the Ten Commandments representing judgment and condemnation for those who ignore God's commands. So it seems like he's wandering around here in the, in the, in the sanctuary in heaven, at least in vision, right? Later in the eschatological section, the section dealing with end time events from Revelation 15 to 22, the second half of the book, we see angels carrying the seven bowls of God's wrath or plagues leaving the sanctuary. When the sanctuary closes at the eschatological end time, we are told about the fall of Babylon, the millennium, and then the new earth containing the new Jerusalem. At that time, there will apparently be no need of a sanctuary anymore. Revelation 20, 21 and 22. And why is there no need for a sanctuary anymore? Because it pointed forward to something that's already happened. And who represents that in heaven? Jesus. The Father and the Son. I mean, think about this. Could you have a place that's most holy while God is somewhere else? No. Contrast temple versus sanctuary. Okay. A temple in heaven versus a sanctuary in heaven. Yeah. We're running out of time, so we might have to answer part of that question in our next section. But think about that. A sanctuary was a small symbol here on this earth uh, that has some of these symbols in it, but it points forward to a much larger temple. David made one. Herod finished up one that, that came along later. But... Uh, these were, these were related, and we'll talk more about that when we come back. Don't go away.
Welcome back. We're so glad you decided to stay with us. Hope you're enjoying this little foray through the book of Revelation. We come now to Revelation 6 and 7. And we're going to see more about the sanctuary as we go along. So don't, if you have questions about that, don't give up. And Revelation 6 and 7, what do we see here? Well, in Revelation 5, each, each section seems to point, look forward to something that's coming up. In Revelation 5, starting the first verse, I saw a scroll in the right hand of the one who sits on the throne. It was covered with writing on both sides and was sealed with seven seals. Now let's stop there for a second. What were these seals? What, what's a seal? This is not one of those things that swim in the water, right? No, it's like the king's, the king's seal. wax seal across. And the what would be the purpose of a scroll with a seal? Keep it from being. It often was a will, mm -hmm. and the seal of the people who were supposed to be present when that will is open was on there, and you couldn't open it until all of the people were there present, then the seals could be broken, and the will, what was in the contents, be, be read. Okay. It, it, there's a couple things that are obvious. Yes, go ahead. I was going to say, but not only that, there was usually only one or maybe two or three people that were legally able to open it. Yeah, so yeah. You couldn't just say, okay, we're all here, let's rip the seals off. It didn't work yeah. that way. Yeah, yeah. And in this case, we have seven seals, and they, it's clear that I mean, a book that we would have today, you could have a seal on the front of it and you could still open the book and look at everything that's in there. But a scroll, if you've got a wax seal, which is what they use, they pour some wax on there and put the, put the stamp in it, you've got a, a wax seal over the, the, the edge of a scroll, you can't get into it until you break that, that seal. It's impossible. Like the king's ring seal on it. Yeah. So forth. So, and I saw a mighty angel who announced in a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? Carrie, this is your comment. Of it. Only certain people had the authority to, to open these seals. But there was no one in heaven or on earth or in the world below who could open the scroll and look inside it. I cried bitterly because no one could be found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside it. Then one of the elders said to me, Don't cry, look. The lion from Judah's tribe. The great descendant of David has won the victory, and he can break the seven seals and open the scroll. Did, why was John weeping to get this, this book open? Did he know what was in it uh, conceptually, and, but no. didn't know the difference, but didn't know the details? Or? I, I think that, I, I suspect, I mean, I, I've not been a prophet in vision, but I suspect that the angel probably implied to him there's something really important there, and he wants to, he wants to see what's okay. in there. All right. Then I saw a lamb standing in the center. So he's been told, he said, that who the, the, the lion from the Judah's tribe is able to open it up. So he looks and he's looking for a lion. What does he see? A lamb standing in the center of the throne, surrounded by the four living creatures and the elders. The lamb appeared to have been killed. And, at seven, and this is important because later in Revelation, we're going to talk about another person who appears to have been killed, another animal that appears to have been killed. It had seven heads and seven horns, which are the seven spirits of God that have been sent throughout the whole earth. So there's another thing suggesting that God's spirit is covering the earth. The lamb went and took the scroll from the right hand of the one who sits on the throne. As he did so, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each had a harp and gold bowls filled with incense, which are the prayers of God's people. They sang a new song. You're worthy to take the scrolls and to break open its seal seals. For you were killed, and by your sacrificial death, you bought for God people from every tribe, language, nation, and race. You have made them a kingdom of priests to serve our God, and they shall rule on earth. Again, I looked, and I heard angels, thousands and millions of them. So here's another indication. We read from Daniel. Now here's one in Revelation. Suggests there's a lot of angels watching what's going on. They stood round the throne, the four living creatures and the elders, and sang in a loud voice, the lamb who was killed is worthy to receive power, wealth, wisdom, and strength, honor, glory, and praise. And I heard every creature in heaven and earth, and the world below and in the sea, all living beings in the universe, and they were singing. To him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be praise and honor, glory and might forever and ever. The four living creatures answered, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. So that's the introduction here. 
we have a, a scroll with something really important apparently written on it and sealed and at first it looks like nobody's going to be able to open it to see what's inside there and John weeps but what happens? We find somebody, right? Yeah. He's a lion and he's a lamb. And what's written on the scroll? Well, Revelation doesn't really tell us. Uh, Ellen White, the founder of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, wrote these words in Christ Object Lessons, page 294, the first paragraph. Thus the Jewish leaders made their choice. It's talking about the days of Christ. Their decision was registered in a book which John saw in the hand of him that sat upon the throne, the book which no man could open. Now, what's that referring to? It's clearly referring to Revelation 5 here, isn't it? In all its vindictiveness, this decision will appear before them in the day when this book is unsealed by the Lion of the tribe of Judah. In other words, what's, go what's in this book? It looks like this is a record of human events, isn't it? Yeah. decisions that people have made and so forth um, so what did Jesus have to do to open the scroll what qualified him to open the scroll you said Kerry that you know the seals. He, he could he break the seals but what qualified him he, was the lamb. he won the great controversy by offering himself by, by demonstrating everything that needed to be demonstrated there on, and through his life and his death on this earth right Right? So he dealt with Satan's accusations and his questions. And that's important because we're moving into discussion of other kinds of creatures who aren't so friendly. Well, do we know anything about other scrolls that looked a little like this? Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 2. There's a scroll like this. Look at that for just a moment. It's Ezekiel chapter 2, verse 8 in the Old Testament. Mortal man. Listen to what I tell you. Don't be rebellious like them, talking about the other children of Israel. Open your mouth and eat what I'm going to give you. I saw a hand stretched out towards me, and it was holding a scroll. The hand unrolled the scroll, and I saw that there was writing on both sides. Cries of grief were written there, and wails and groans. So um, that might sound a little bit like what we're talking about, and there's other places in the Old Testament that mention something like that. Again, we've got seven seals. What, what is the significance of seven? Perfect number. Perfect. A perfect number. It represents a complete something. Um, so what are we supposed to see here? Um, it's interesting to note that there's a kind of play on words in this section of Revelation. Revelation 5 and 6, we see seven seals being opened one by one. In Revelation 7, we see God's final remnant people being sealed with a seal of the living God. So that's an interesting comparison. When opened, the first four seals reveal consecutively four horsemen. What do we know about these four horsemen? Well, let's just look at that. That would be Revelation 6, right? Then I saw the Lamb break open the first of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures say in a loud voice that sounded like thunder, Come! I looked, and there was a white horse. Its rider held a bow, and he was given a crown. He rode out as a conqueror to conquer. So, white horse, a conqueror. Who might that represent? Well, in the book of Daniel, First, there was a, an image that had outlines of the future. Mm -hmm. And then uh, in Daniel 7, we see beasts that kind of recapitulate the, the same thing. Mm -hmm. I guess it wouldn't be unreasonable then to, to look at these things and say maybe this is kind of a recapitulation of what was in the first part of Revelation. Yeah. Going back over it, maybe giving a little different picture of what... Yeah. Well, we already saw the first three chapters talking about what was going on within the Christian church itself. Right. And now we'll see what's going on here. So who would be the best one to represent what was at least supposed to be going on in the days, for example, of the Ephesian church? The apostolic pure church. Yeah. And the leader of that church would be Jesus himself, wouldn't he? So he might be the one who going forth to conquer on a white horse, huh? Well, then the Lamb broke open the second seal, and I heard the second living creature say, Come. 
Another horse came out, a red one. Oh boy, what does that imply? Things have gone south. <laughs> things, things aren't so good anymore. Huh? No. Red usually implies Shit. war, oh, bloodshed. bloodshed. Uh, it just says that he was given the power to bring war on the earth so that people should kill each other. He was given a large sword. Now, in those early days, who was killing who? The Roman Empire, for example, was killing a lot of Christians. Lot of Christians. They had to start off with. Uh, and then, unfortunately, it got to the place where one group of Christians were killing other groups of Christians. Things deteriorated, right? So what happens next? Third seal. Then the Lamb broke open the third seal, and I heard the third living creature say, Come! I looked, and there was a black horse. Now what's happened? Yeah. We're drinking the dregs. <laughs> <laughs> drinking the dregs. Well, this is about as far from white as you can get, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it sounds like, you know, things are in pretty bad shape. A liter of wheat for a day's wages? I mean, can you, if you worked all day long and they gave you one liter, one quart of wheat, you'd just barely make it, wouldn't you? That's, that's, that's enough, a, enough for a couple of loaves, right? Yeah, exactly. Barely. barely. Depends upon how many you have to feed with that. Yeah, yeah exactly. Three liters of barley, that's not much more. Do not damage the olive trees and the vineyards, and of course, we could speculate for a long time about what all that implies, but then the lamb broke open the fourth seal, and I heard the fourth living creature say, come. I looked, and there was a pale-colored horse. Now what's happened? Its rider was named Death. Yeah. This looks like a mixture of white and black. Yeah, yeah. And Hades followed close behind. What's Hades? That's the dump. <laughs> okay, it could be a dump, but death? Huh? yeah, just death. Yeah, Hades really means the grave. Yeah, so if death is marching forward, who, what's behind? Uh, the natural thing that would come behind would be a lot of graves, right? They were given authority over a quarter of the earth to kill by means of war, famine, disease, and wild animals. What could that have been? Well, there were, there were some serious plagues back in those early years, and we didn't have antibiotics. We didn't, there was the Black Plague, and there were other things that happened where lots and lots of people died. Um, and they were... What, what, but in the context of the church, what do you think this represents? Well, um, and that's a good question. Uh, clearly, it's a deterioration of things in the yeah. church. It must refer to uh, the, the majority of so-called Christians weren't following God. They certainly weren't white on the white horse. Well, if you take the black and white fusion yeah. model, then you've got syncretism where you've got paganism and Christianity trying to mm -hmm. be the same thing. It's, things have become so bad here that it's almost like wild animals have taken over. Yeah. Okay. Well, there's some interesting parallels between Revelation 6 and 7. Let's, let's read a little bit more here and see if we can see some of them. Um, we have the fifth seal. The Lamb broke open the fifth seal. I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who had been killed because they had proclaimed God's word and had been faithful in their witness, witnessing. Does that sound like any time in early church history? Dark age. The dark ages. There were a lot of people killed because they tried to bear true witness. They shouted in a loud voice, Almighty Lord, holy and true, how long will it be until you judge the people on earth and punish them for killing us? In other words, they're asking for what? Justice. Justice, judgment. Huh? Each of them was given a white robe. They were told to rest a little while longer until the complete number of their fellow servants and fellow Christians had been killed as they had been. Talk a little bit about souls under the altar. Yeah. Fair enough. Um, if you read uh, my version. Um, what verse are you at there? That would be Revelation, Revelation 6. 6, verse 9. The word souls comes from the Greek word psuche, or from which we get psychology. So if you're studying psychology, you're studying souls. So what would you be studying? St psychology is a study of what? Character. Character. People. It's the character of humans and behavior, right? Yeah, so 
This is not talking about some kind of something separate from human beings that maybe can disappear and go off to heaven or something like that. Not at all. It's talking about human beings. So the these human beings, their their remembrance or whatever record there is, is there uh, saying we were we were massacred. What's going to happen because of that? Yeah. And then we see, I saw the, the lamb break open the sixth seal. There was a violent earthquake, and the sun became black like coarse black cloth, and the moon turned completely red like blood. The stars fell down to the earth like unripe figs falling from the tree when a strong wind shakes it. The sky disappeared like a scroll being rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved from its place. Now, um, do we have any idea when these things are happening? Think we're only we, we have sometimes pointed to the Lisbon earthquake as being the violent earthquake. That would be 1755. The, the sun became day. black like a coarse black cloth and the moon turned completely red like blood. When was that? May 19, 1780. The stars fell to the, down to the earth like unripe figs falling from the tree when a strong wind shakes it. When was that? November 13, 1833. So... What's going on here? Look what happens next. The sky disappeared like a scroll being rolled up and every mountain and island was moved from its place. Has that happened yet? No. No. Quite. So we, we find ourselves there between verses 13 and 14, don't we? Yep. On the edge of it. That sure seems like it. Yes. Uh, not all religions see verse 9 as we do because the Mormons go through a baptism of the soul and all this yeah they don't view it quite like we do yeah very very much so uh, mm -hmm. souls have been um, the traditional Catholic teaching is that mm -hmm. souls are trapped inside of the body and this is this is a pagan teaching which goes back to to Plato the idea that a soul is trapped inside of a body and and when we die the body breaks apart and the soul escapes and if you believe in an immortal soul, yeah. then you read this and you get an entirely different yeah. uh, reading than if you say, no, there is no such thing as an immortal soul. What could this mean yeah. when it talks about a soul? Yeah. Record. It's got to be yeah. something like that. Well, what happens next? Then the kings of the earth, the rulers and the military chiefs, the rich and the powerful, and all other people, slave and free, hid themselves in caves under rocks on the mountains. They called out to the mountains and to the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the eyes of the one who sits on the throne and from the anger of the Lamb. The terrible day of their anger is here, and who can stand against it? So now, what have we seen here? It looks like we start off with a fairly pure church, a, a, a time when, when, when Christ is victorious and riding out like that, and now we've come all the way down to what's this doing? What's going on here? This is a final judgment, right? Yeah. This is a final judgment scene. And what happens next in the final judgment scene? Well, chapter 7 talks about the 144,000. After this, I saw four angels. I'm reading from Revelation 7 now, the first three verses. After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds so that no wind should blow on the earth or the sea or against any tree. Now, what would that, what, what, what do winds imply? Strive war. Strive war. Bloodshed, maybe. Um, and I saw another angel coming up from the east with the seal of the living God. Now, we've been talking about seals on a, on a document. Now we're talking about seals bought by the angel. What's he going to do with this seal? He called out in a loud voice to the four angels to whom God had given the power to damage the earth and the sea. The angel said, do not harm the earth and the sea or the trees until we mark the servants. What's he doing with them? With his seal? Sealing them, marking He's them foreheads. He's putting, putting a seal on these people till we mark the servants of our God with a seal on their foreheads. So what's happening there? Is this that the person that is holy be holy still, and that him that is yeah. filthy be filthy still? And this is not the first time that we've read about something like that. Do you know where, where else it talks about this in the Bible? Anybody? Ezekiel 9. Ezekiel 9. Let's look at that real quick. We don't have too much more time, but look at that. Then he heard God shout, 
Come here, you men who are going to punish the city. Bring your weapons with you. At once, six men came from the outer north gate of the temple, each one carrying a weapon. With them was a man dressed in linen clothes, carrying something to write with. They all came and stood by the bronze altar. Then the dazzling light of the presence of the God of Israel rose up from the ring creatures where it had been and moved to the entrance of the temple. The Lord called to the man dressed in linen, Go through the whole city of Jerusalem and put a mark on the forehead of everyone who is distressed and troubled because of all the disgusting things being done in the city. So who gets marked? The people that are worried about what's going what's on. What's going on. Yeah, the people who don't want to be a part of the evil that's going on. They want to separate themselves. They say, that's wrong. We don't want to be a part of it. Could that maybe have something to do with what's going on in Revelation? Likely. Very likely. John uses, and God and John, use so many symbols from the Old Testament that it seems very likely that uh, he's probably thinking about Ezekiel when, when he wrote this. By the way, it starts from the elders in the church there in Ezekiel 9. You think that might be happening and the first people to be judged would be Christians? Uh, yeah, because there has to be a decision made mm -hmm. uh, when before Christ comes as to who he's going to take with him. So look at look here. We've, we, we've suggested that in 18, the, Daniel 8:14, 8, there's a 2300-year prophecy. It ends in, in, in 1844, as far as our calculation, if they're, if they're accurate, and I believe they are. Now we see that somewhere between verse 13 and 14 of Revelation 6, mm -hmm. what's happening? We're, we're in there, and suddenly he takes a break. We, we've noticed before that he goes six, there's six, and there's a kind of a break, and then he goes on to the seventh. During that break, what's happening? The 144,000 are sealed in their foreheads. So now, apparently... Would that be happening there between verses 13 and 14? Mm -hmm. We're approaching the end, and these are people. How do people get sealed? First, I mean, it seems like something we would want to have happen, you've right? You've got a yes. good quote for that. What is the seal? It, yeah. What if I thought f the seal is the Holy Spirit? Someone else may think it's something else. What exactly is that seal? What does the seal well, do? Well, let's, let's, let's look what we can find in the Bible first. Look at Ephesians 1, verse 13. And you also became God's people when you heard the true message, the good news that brought you salvation. You believed in Christ, and God put his stamp of ownership, and guess what that is? That's a seal. A stamp of ownership on you by giving you the Holy Spirit he has promised. So God gives a stamp of ownership, and along with that comes what? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has something to do with that. And look at chapter 4 of Ephesians again, verse 31. Get rid of all bitterness, passion, anger. You, no more shouting or insults, no more hateful feelings of any sort. Instead, be kind and tenderhearted to one another and fear of one another as God has forgiven you through Christ. And I should have started, I'm sorry, one verse sooner in verse 30. Do not make God's Holy Spirit sad, for the Spirit is God's mark of ownership on you, a guarantee that the day will come when God will set you free. So it's Ephesians 4, verse 30 there, where it talks, the Holy Spirit is God's mark of ownership on us. Ellen White came through marvelously in 1902, um, and she said these words, just as soon as the people of God are sealed in their foreheads, it is not any seal or mark that can be seen, but a settling into the truth, both intellectually that would be, they've thought it through, they're convinced, they're, con you know, absolutely converted. They're, they're, they're with this. And spiritually, that means they're, they're out, they're ready to witness, they're ready to, to really espouse God's truth on this subject. So they cannot be moved, they're settled, they're sealed. Just as soon as God's people are sealed and prepared for the shaking, it will come. So are we waiting for God? Is God waiting for us? I think it's like the latter. Sounds like he's waiting for us to get ready, doesn't it? That
quotation, if you, if you would like to look at it, is found in SDA Bible Commentary, Volume 4, page 1161, and paragraph 6. But By the way... He will not wait forever. No. No, he will not. By the way, if you um, would like to see all these materials that we're looking at, we put, the, put them together and hand out in lots of other materials that are available on our website at theox, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. So, um, how do we become so settled into the truth that we can't be moved? We've said it's the work of the Holy Spirit, right? What is the main thing that the work that the Holy Spirit has done for us down to for the church down through the ages? Lead us into all truth. Yeah, and he how does he how does he lead us into truth? Study the word. Yeah. The main thing that the Holy Spirit has provided for us is God's word, the Bible. That's the main product. He inspired the prophets, he inspired the apostles. It's the Bible that prepares us if we follow, we read it, we learn all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So, now we come to the seventh seal. We're not, we're just about done with the, se the seals here, and we have to dip into chapter 8. When the Lamb broke open the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. Then I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and they were given seven trumpets. And we move on to the next group of sevens. Silence in heaven? I mean, we saw God, His throne, Christ is there, there's four living creatures, there's 24 elders, there's hundreds of millions of angels. How can there be silence? Because they just went to earth. <laughs> and why would they be coming to earth? Because it's all coming to an end. Second coming of Christ. And I mean, and think about it, if you were an angel, and you've been waiting for thousands of years to see this whole great controversy play out, and now finally God says, it's done. We're, they're ready. Let's go. I mean, wouldn't you want to be there? I wonder how many creatures from other worlds oh, yeah. are going to yeah, be absolutely. involved in say, I want to go down and look at that too. Exactly. Ellen White says, commenting about the time when the angels announced the birth of Jesus, she says, at the second coming, the entire sky will be full of glowing, beaming, brilliant angels. Try to imagine the sky completely full of angels. And we'll have to end there. We'll see you next week.